It's my absolute pleasure to welcome your presenter for this afternoon, Robert Yang. Robert is an international presenter on nutrition, corrective exercise and sports performance, and he has joined us all the way from sunny California. Robert uses integrative and individualised programs to help clients improve performance, health and vitality while preventing injury. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Robert Yang. Thanks, Chantel. I'm really happy to be here. We had a good session this morning. So welcome, all of you, to Understanding Hormones. With hormones, we have differing hormones in the body. From male to female, you want some, not too much, not too little. What I want to show all of you today is, one, what do hormones look like when it's dysfunctional? What to look for? Signs in yourself, signs in your clients, as well as why? And that's the question we must always ask is, why are the hormones low? Just like in corrective exercise, if someone has low back pain, why? Why is it occurring? We need to find the etiology of the problem. And then thirdly, what you can do about it for yourself or for your clients and how you can guide them and, and help them. Now, we talked about connecting this morning with, with Matt Church, which, I mean, he was a brilliant presenter. And let's start connecting with each other. Uh, you can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter. You guys can tweet. Uh, this guy, Robert, uh, has a horrible yellow shirt on. He's a wanker, whatever. But let's start a discussion on hormones. Let's discuss some things so that we can start learning from each other. We're here to learn. I'm here to learn. Uh, as much as you guys may learn from me, I'm learning from other presenters or learning from you guys as you guys ask questions. Uh, I learn best when I'm actually teaching. So hopefully you will walk away with some, uh, some new concepts, uh, some better understandings of hormones uh, and how it relates to behavior and nutrition, lifestyle, food, etc. So going into hormones, typically if you say the word hormones, you think of a, a woman. And it can affect a woman from as young as 12 or 13 as they're going through puberty or all the way to a woman who's going through menopause. So hormones will span a woman's lifetime and there can be all sorts of symptoms uh, within a female's lifetime. Uh, it's not just a menopausal woman. It's not just uh, someone who's uh, having dysmenorrhea and going through uh, puberty. Now, fellas, I'm not going to leave you out either because with males, males can also have hormonal dysfunction. As you'll see later on in the lecture, there's plenty of males, and it doesn't have to be an older gentleman. It could be a younger uh, male as well that can have hormonal dysfunction. I, I've seen it on a clinical scale, and you're also seeing it uh, in a lot of research that's coming out that the ages are getting younger and younger, and there are many reasons why uh, that's occurring. It's not a surprise. Um, it was about to happen, and it's becoming more prevalent. So with WHI, this stands for the Women's Health Initiative. So I don't know if any of you remember, but in 2002, they stopped the women, Women's Health Initiative. And this health initiative was a study about hormone replacement therapy, so HRT for short. And this study was supposed to be for about eight years looking at the benefits of hormone replacement therapy. So looking at the estrogens, the progestins, and seeing how that would affect a woman. In 2002, they stopped the study short, five years, instead of going the full eight years, because there were lots of side effects with these HRT hormones. So a lot of women during these time, this day and age of being on Premarin, all these synthetic hormones, ended up stopping them because there were massive uh, implications with cardiovascular disease. So a lot of women were having CBD. Uh, they were having issues with cancer as well. So we know that there's cancer that's rampant within, doesn't matter what country you're in. It used to be about one in 20. Now it's probably one in every two. Uh, I am sure everybody knows somebody that has had cancer, family member, uh, your close relative, even your parents, a brother and sister, uh, it's, it's quite rampant. So they stopped the study. Uh, some of the other side effects were was stroke. So one of the problems with 
looking at the, uh, the hormones and the interaction with the blood was it was causing embolisms, which basically just means a big old blood clot and it's uh, causing a, a traffic jam within uh, the arteries. And so a lot of women were scared to take hormones, but yet they were having all kinds of symptoms and signs of hormonal dysfunction. So it was a bit of a rock and a hard place. What, what, is, what do these women do? Um, and so some women could just continue to stay at home because they were led to believe that it, you need it for your osteoporosis or you need it for something else. And so there was a lot of confusion going on. With all, you know, some people say, well, all hormone replacement therapy is bad. There is a big difference. So some of you may have heard of bioidentical hormones. So there are bioidentical hormones that are chemically, structurally exactly like the hormones in your body. For example, estrogen, progesterone, uh, these hormones. The synthetically derived hormones that were in the Women's Health Initiative were all synthetically derived. So they were chemically made. Uh, they were not bound to hormones. And there's plenty of research to show that there is a massive difference between synthetically derived hormones and bioidentical hormones. There are a lot of different side effects with synthetically derived hormones, and that's why they had to stop that women's health initiative because there are so many different side effects. So there is a place, a time and place for hormone replacement therapy, but it has to be the right type, and bioidentical hormones are the way to go. Now, that goes way beyond the scope of our talk, but for those of you that need to refer out, then you need to scope out someone in your area who may be well-versed in bioidentical hormone therapy uh, with a naturopath or some other endocrinologist that's well versed in it. But even before that, you're going to see that there are so many different factors in regards to hormonal health, it'll blow your mind. And they're not complicated at all. And it's, in fact, what all of you do and probably recommend to your clients already, but you're just not aware of it. Now, the reason why the synthetically derived hormones are so bad is because they derive it from horse urine. It's a conjugated equine estrogen. So no wonder there's so many different side effects. I don't want to want to be putting horse urine in my body if I was a female. So there are lots of different side effects uh, with those. So you have to be very wary of them. Now, classically, with hormone dysfunction, you're going to see menopausal symptoms with a woman as they're going through that transition. The technical definition of menopause is that a woman has not had a menstrual cycle for one full year. That's the technical definition. So after that point, then a woman can probably safely say that they're going through the change, they're going through menopause. Now, some of the symptoms that some of these women go through are simply just anxiety. So beforehand, before they started missing their periods and, and going through that change and the ovary stopped producing the hormones, typical little things wouldn't bother them, but they're becoming anxious with a lot of different things. Anxiety starts increasing throughout the day. Uh, the husband's going, what's wrong? You know, these things typically don't bother you. So anxiety uh, increases. Unfortunately, they go to the doctor and they give them maybe anti-anxiety medication and that causes all sorts of other side effects. A big one is short-term loss of memory. So a lot of women with menopause will say, God, I just, Rob, I cannot figure out where I put my keys and I just put them down about two minutes ago. And they go, I cannot remember. Or someone just told them their phone number. Like, Can you tell me again? I can't remember it. Um, for those of us that don't understand that, uh, that can be very debilitating uh, to some of our women clients, and it can be a real big problem. This one is obvious enough. Uh, I mean, it can be so bad that some women, they, they wake up and they say, Rob, I have to, I literally have to change my clothes. I have to pull the sheets off, and it's really, really bad. Or their husband just says, I have to literally get her, like, a towel in a bucket because she's just sweating. You'll see later on that Yes, that is a symptom of possible menopause, but there are certain lifestyle factors that can affect these menopausal symptoms. Uh, and you'll be surprised of how simple it really is. And clinically, I've seen uh, some quite uh, good reductions in menopausal symptoms, such as hot flashes, 
uh, that are just simple uh, lifestyle recommendations. Uh, this is another one. On average, when a woman goes through menopause, she gains about 20 pounds. So we have to be cognizant of that, especially if all of us in the fitness industry. One of the main reasons why a client comes to you and hires you is that they want to look better, they want to lose fat, they want to lose weight. So we have to consider this as well. And sometimes they may be doing all the right things, um, and, but yet they're still gaining weight. They're just not seeing progress. So that's where you may have to start looking at, okay, hormones might have a hand in why they're not progressing. And you know the client because it does everything to see. They exercise, they eat appropriately, but yet they're still not seeing the results that you think they should. Headaches are another one. Uh, it could be minor headaches that are occurring uh, on a daily basis. They could uh, progress to severe migraines where people are literally out for a day or two at a time. But to, to have a slight headache or any sort of head pressure is not normal function. Uh, that shouldn't be normal for, for these women. They should have a clear head, uh, and, and you guys can eventually help them with that with the recommendations I'm going to show you today. Incontinence is a big one. So we don't think about it, but uh, the, as we know, the pelvic floor is very, very important for women as they get older. Uh, it's just simply a, a Kegel exercise. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's simply the muscles that stop your flow of urine. So if you're going to the loo and you're stopping your flow of urine, that's basically the pelvic floor. Um, men, as well as women, lose the ability to use their pelvic floor. So as fitness professionals, one of the things you must always do is have your clients deep squat all the time. Uh, as much as I am a nutritionist, and I'm wearing my hat as a nutritionist, I have a private practice in San Diego where I have my own studio, and one of uh, the types of clients I do see are dysfunctional, uh, I guess you can say, internal units in regards to the TVA, the internal oblique, the external oblique, in regards to corrective exercise for the abdominal wall. And oftentimes, uh, when you have some kind of dysfunction in that chain of events, whether it's pelvic floor, TVA, internal oblique, external oblique, uh, incontinence may be a problem. And whenever you deep squat somebody, everything turns on. Now, am I saying deep squat them with three plates going all the way down? That's not what I'm saying. But most people should be able to, to simply squat down and go into a deep squat with their heels flat. And eventually, it doesn't matter if you're corrective exercise, no matter if you're a strength coach, each of your clients should be able to do that eventually. Unless they have a frank orthopedic injury, like a disc injury or a spondy, something like that that prevents them to, because that helps activate the pelvic floor. So in an exercise capacity, you can really help with this. Insomnia is a big one. Stats show us, and this is just a general stat, so it doesn't, it just spans beyond women, but 50% of people, close to 50%, rarely or never have a good night's sleep. That's about 50% of our clientele. So you wonder why they can't make it through your class or your exercise session. They're probably not sleeping well, and they're taking all kinds of drugs and medications to try to sleep. For those that sleep well, we have no idea what that feels like. But if you think back to one night where you couldn't go to bed and you're just thinking about all sorts of things, you're like, God, I just can't go to bed. It took me two hours to go to bed. Well, almost 50% of people have the inability to get a good night's rest of sleep. They just can't sleep at all unless they take a medication or do something else. Now, moving on from menopause, if you look at a woman that has maybe they're moody or some people say they're God, what a bitch. Um, I don't say that, but other people do. Um, they could be moody. Um, they could you know, say certain things they normally don't say. And the stats show us that women past the childbearing years, 60% of them have dysmenorrhea, cramping, bloating, you name it, all across the board. Uh, and about 40% uh, of women in the childbearing years have some sort of symptom, whether it's the cramping, bloating, dysmenorrhea. And what's really disturbing is that 10% of women cannot function. So they take ibuprofen, they do aspirin, whatever meds they need to take, 
in order to make it through the day. And even then, their lives are completely disrupted because of the hormonal fluctuations uh, during the menstrual cycle. So we have to be weary of this and we have to know these things because otherwise they could be coming into an exercise session and we're just giving them a hard time or we're not being understanding because they're actually going through some severe changes for a couple days at a time. Uh, The other uh, thing that you'll see is the inconsistency of the menstrual cycle. So sometimes they're 28 days, other times they're 35 days, uh, sometimes they're you know, 26 days. So the up and down of the menstrual cycle is also a symptom of hormonal dysfunction as well. Uh, as I said, cramping is another one. So that's a big one. And so what that ends up leading to is the overconsumption of the ibuprofens, the acetaminophens, uh, to deal with the pain as well as the cramping and inflammation that's occurring. Uh, low back pain is another one. So uh, for those of us that, I mean, all of us are somehow in a capacity of working with someone with exercise, uh, we have to be somewhat cautious uh, about uh, loading someone, especially uh, during their menstrual cycle. Because in that situation, uh, they're having low back pain. So in the presence of pain, for those of you that are corrective exercise specialists, In the presence of pain, muscles will tend to shut down and be inhibited and not want to work. So when a woman comes to you and says, oh man, my back is really achy or my SI joint is, you know, it just feels like it's really painful right in this area. That's the sacroiliac joint. Well, then you need to take precautions and be careful when you're loading that person with axial loading, whether it's squats or deadlifts, overhead pressing, anything that's loading uh, the spinal column, you have to be worried because potentially you could do more harm and more damage because in the presence of pain, those key muscles that we are normally should be on, like the transverse adonis, the internal oblique, the external oblique, uh, the pelvic floor, those muscles don't want to turn on, the diaphragm. So in the presence of pain, just be aware of that, whether they're menstruating or not, female, male, be careful loading them and putting them through hardcore exercises. You may have to downgrade the exercises just for that session until that is sorted out. And sometimes women get crazy in the head. Um, and it's just, sometimes I say, God, Robert, I, I feel bad for my boyfriend. I mean, I know that I just get kind of crazy the couple days before my period, but I feel so bad, but I can't control it. <laughs> um, and, and it does happen. Um, and it's so something that, you know, unfortunately, that some of us males have to go through. Um, as, as well as females uh, with friends, but um, you know, it, it's one of those symptoms that does occur. Uh, depression is another one. More and more, we're seeing women and males being depressed. And so it can be a real problem because now what's happening is it could be simply just due to a dysfunctional menstrual cycle, but yet they go to the doc and say, hey, you know, I'm really having some depressive thoughts. So what ends up coming out? the pad comes out, prescription for some type of antidepressant, whether it's a SSRI, which stands for the Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. Um, They do work, but they're quite addictive, and they do have side effects. As with all medications, uh, they all have side effects. And then also, women have inability to sleep, just like with some of our women clients with menopausal symptoms, and so they're taking all sorts of medications, whether it's Ambien, uh, which are really, really hard and very, very uh, addictive because that's the only way that they feel like they can go to sleep. And so what they end up doing is they get prescriptions filled and they continually have to use this. Uh, Not being able to sleep is is not a deficiency of Ambien. Uh, You should be able to sleep uh, appropriately at night uh, without any sort of help. Um, acne, as some of you know, is a big one as well. Uh, as the hormones are fluctuating, um, acne can be a big one. Uh, with food, uh, my opinion is that, yes, there are some hormonal disruptions, but oftentimes there are many different foods that people are eating in the name of health that are causing these sorts of hormonal fluctuations as well as uh, causing a breakout. Always remember, guys, that skin is one of the largest organs of your body. So if someone is breaking out in acne, or they're breaking out in hives or rashes, uh, they've got eczema, it's a sign that something is trying to come out of the skin. 
It's one of the ways that your body detoxifies itself. So use that as a sign. So if you constantly notice that your client's breaking out in hives or rashes or complaining about having itchy skin, then there's something going on. Um, I believe tomorrow I'm going to be talking about detox. And so I'm going to talk a lot about uh, these sorts of reactions that people have that they're most likely probably not detoxing properly. Sugar cravings. Chocolate. That's a big one. So it could be chocolate or it could be salty, salty chips, something with a crunch. Uh, it could be candy, but there's usually some kind of craving going on, and that's usually an imbalance. Sometimes with the hormones, but you'll see later on, uh, for example, with uh, chocolate in itself, that's a classic sign of most likely magnesium deficiency, and I'll talk about that later. So when someone is, you know, you, let's say you give them a choice. You say, uh, what would you want? Would you want candy or do you want chocolate? I go, chocolate. Uh, candy doesn't matter, Starburst, Skittles, or whatever else. They, they want chocolate, and it's a constant craving, and usually that's a deficiency of magnesium. Uh, the cacao bean, uh, that bean has probably the most amount of magnesium out of all the different beans that are out there, so that's why there's such a kind of a calming effect uh, when people have chocolate, besides the sugar. And this is another one. So having bloating, uh, they normally wear a size 6, and then that can't even get into a size 8 uh, because of the fluctuation of... We're, we're talking about hormones, but you'll see later on is that hormones are not just simply estrogen and progesterone for a woman. There's also testosterone, there's cortisol, but there's also what we call aldosterone, and that has a major impact on how we balance water, sodium, potassium, and... For some of you women that go through this you know, the monthly cycle, sometimes the weight can change anywhere from two to seven, eight pounds at a time. So it can make a massive difference. Now, enough about you women. We're talking about the guys. So this is a male sign for a guy. One of the biggest problems that we're having, you look at any sports magazine, you look at any sports television show, at least in America, we're allowed to show drug commercials, but there will be some kind of commercial on erectile dysfunction, ED. And so a lot of males are having issues with getting it up and keeping it up. Um, some women are laughing. <laughs> and it's not just the older gentlemen. Clinically, I see males in their mid-30s that are taking Viagra, Cialis, and these medications. I'm saying, what's up, bud? What's going on? There's a reason why it's happening. But unfortunately, the ages are getting younger and younger while they're using these medications. If you're 35 and you have to use that, there's something seriously going on because you're not able to properly hold an erection. That's a big sign. The other sign is that for some of the males, they won't admit it, but when they come see me, they go, well, Rob, you know, it's like, I'm 36 and... I just don't have any sex drive at all. Um, they might not, they might have ability to hold an erection, but they just don't have a sex drive uh, like they did in their 30s. And it's drastically changed within a couple of years. So this is happening more frequently um, with the male clients as well. And depression is a big one too. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's so true what Matt was saying this morning about the increase in the use of antidepressants. I've had as young as an eight-year-old uh, being on medications uh, and as 18-year-old being on medications for eight years. Uh, antidepressants, ADD drugs, um, all sorts of other drugs that they just rotate through to see if it works. And we simply fix them by just simple lifestyle choices, food, water, and he's good to go and he's good in college. So don't think that um, you as fitness people are only exercise people. You can help people to make differences in regards to their hormones in the long term. And I've even had grown men cry in my office. I mean, I kind of stopped. I didn't know really what to say because they started tearing up and welling up and crying. So don't think that uh, women are hormonal. They cry. They do those things. Guys do the same thing. They probably just don't show it very often. 
Um, but it does happen, which is quite surprising. Uh, and for males, um, lots of males are having lots of body fat around the midsection, and they're also growing breast tissue. So we call them man boobs. Uh, we kind of joke around, but um, it's a serious problem that a lot of the males that I'm seeing are, are having. And it can be equated to one thing, which is estrogen. Uh, yes, females have more estrogen uh, than males, but what is surprisingly happening is that the estrogen levels in males are going up, uh, and quite exponentially. I typically do a lot of hormonal testing in my practice. So what I'll do is I'll typically collect their, have them collect their saliva four times throughout the day, and I'll also look at their sex hormones. I never really looked at estrogen for males, but in the last probably four to five years, I've looked at estrogen on all my athletes and all my males. And it doesn't matter if they're an elite athlete or whether they're just a, a gym rat or whether they just play golf recreationally. Um, the estrogen levels are two to three, sometimes four times higher than they, what they should be. They should be between one to three. And I think guys sometimes at 12. Um, that's extraordinarily high. And unfortunately, uh, it's just things in our water supply. So what's happening is that they're looking at animals such as whales and crocodiles and alligators, and the males are having smaller penises because what's happening is estrogen competes for testosterone in these animals as well as with us, and so we're getting a dominance of estrogen, which is becoming a big problem. Or what's happening in our males is that they're just living a lifestyle uh, that is not conducive to testosterone production, and what's up, what ends up happening is that the estrogen uh, goes through a process called aromatization, which converts the estrogen to testosterone. So you classically see that with uh, some of the athletes and bodybuilders that take a lot of exogenous anabolic steroids. One of the problems they have is that when they take too much testosterone, it converts to estrogen, and it gives them man boobs, and it gives them all sorts of other estrogenic-like effects. And that's happening just within our water, our food supply, uh, and some other things that are happening uh, with what we're doing. Uh, one of the things I want to make all of you aware of in regards to medications, especially with our males, that are over the age of 40, and sometimes even with the female clients, is that the cholesterol-lowering medications are a big problem. Uh, the number one selling drug in the world is Lipitor. So anytime that you have a client that gets their blood work, it's over 200 uh, with their cholesterol, they're going to recommend that you go on a statin to lower your cholesterol. The problem is that just the side effects themselves can mask symptoms, and they may seem like the hormonal symptoms. So for example, when these medications are taken, all medications, they work on an enzyme level. That's how your body functions ultimately when you break it down to the bare bones of it. It's your body functions with enzymes. So when they take this medication, they take it, and there's an enzyme called HMG coag reductase. Don't ask me what the long name of it is because I probably don't remember. I'm not smart enough to. Uh, but the thing is that they take the medication, and it's a key that locks down that horm uh, the enzyme. So they take the medication, it locks it down, and boom, you can't produce any of the HMG coi reductase. So th therefore, your cholesterol level drops, and the studies show between 30 to 40 percent. Once it drops, the cholesterol levels are low, but the cascade of that event also affects your body's production of CoQ10. You guys know what CoQ10 is. It's called coenzyme Q10. So it's a mineral-like nutrient that you can take as a supplement form. But if you exercise, you run, you weight train, you do any sort of exercise, your body ramps up its production of CoQ10. But if you take this med, you're not making any of it. It stops the enzyme production of it. So what ends up happening is whether you're male or female, but typically more male are prescribed this medication, because they're supposedly more prone to having a heart attack, what ends up happening is their CoQ10 production goes down. So what happens? Their energy level goes down the tank. And then also their myopathy goes up. So they have muscle pains. Now, there's even research showing that it affects their brain protein synthesis, so that it starts affecting their memory, short-term and long-term memory. So be aware of when your clients are on medications. All of you at one point should have at least one paperwork saying what medications are you on. That way you can have an understanding of what they're actually taking 
and how it can impact their body in the long term. Uh, it reminds me, I, I have it in maybe another slide uh, in another presentation, but there is a book called the Nutrition Depletion Handbook. So it's called the Nutrition Depletion Handbook. It's by, uh, I think he's a uh, PhD, but his name's Ross Pelton, R-O-S-S-P-E-L-T-O-N. And he goes to a lot of the different medications and what nutrients that it depletes. So you look up a statin medication, which is basically Lipitor, and it'll show you CoQ10 gets reduced. Uh, it shows up the blood pressure medication. It shows you that magnesium gets reduced. You need to be aware of that because whatever medication your client's taking could be affecting their energy level, which is ultimately going to affect how they are when they're taking your class or spending an hour with you three times a week. And if they are taking this statin medication, what you need to do is you recommend... You, uh, we can't, as fitness professionals, or I can't even as a nutritionist, ever tell somebody to stop taking medication or to take a medication. We're not licensed medical professionals. But what you can do is you are in the business of inspiring, like Matt was saying, but also educating your client. So at that period of time, you say, look, these are the different nutrients that get depleted. You need to go to a quality health food store and get coenzyme Q10, and you need to take this because it's getting depleted. And hopefully over a period of time, they'll take responsibility for their health, health and make a decision whether they want to take that Lipitor medication or not. You guys got that? But you have to do that. What's really shitty, sorry, it's a really technical term, is that the, med the pharmaceutical companies, they have a medication that has CoQ10 in it already, but they won't release it because nobody's demanding that they release it. They already do all the research. They know that it depletes CoQ10, but they won't release it and sell it. Bloody bastards, but anyways. Uh, so we've always got to ask why. Why are our clients having these symptoms? Why are they having hot flashes? Why are they having the cramping, the bloating, etc.? And ultimately, you have to ask this question because what happens is they go to the doctor, they go, oh, okay, well, let's look at your blood work. Um, it, it looks like it's normal, but let's put you on some estrogen anyways. Let's see if it helps. If it does help, yeah, that may be okay in the short term, but that may not be the driving cause of their symptoms, or that may not be the driving cause of why their hormones are low. So ultimately what it is, it's just a Band-Aid approach. It's not a long-term solution. So what ends up happening, they might be okay for six months, maybe nine months, maybe a year, and then they start getting symptoms. And then they go, oh my God, Rob, a year I'm okay, but then I just noticed after that six months, I freaking put on like seven kilos. They're like, it was overnight. When you hear something like that, you know there's some kind of hormonal dysfunction going on. Seven kilos of weight doesn't happen, happen overnight. Um, so just be aware of that. Stress is one of the major causes of hormonal dysfunction. Yes, hormones are low, but they're low because most of our clients are stressed out. How many of you have zero stress? Raise your hand. Raise them high. Okay, we got one person. They got zero stress. I want to be him. <laughs> Most of our clients have lots of stress within the system. And as you'll see, that has a huge impact on how your hormones are produced. And stress comes in all these different forms. They, they have anxiety. They worry about things. Uh, they have fear. They have different phobias, um, whatever they are. And what it comes down to is this. That there was a whiteboard. That's all right. You guys will get the, I'll give you a visual image of this. Let's say uh, you're an animal and you're in the desert. What is the first priority as an animal in the desert? So I hear food, water, what else? What else? Okay, shelter, safety, right? That should be the ultimate goal of any animal is safety. Now, translate to us. What's part of safety? Any of you know? What would be safety? What makes you safe? Anybody? What if someone loses their job? Do they feel safe? 
right? Comfort. If someone loses a family member, do they feel safe? If they lose their home, do they feel safe? No. So what happens is this is what we call the limbic system, or you'll, you'll hear about like a reptilian system, but it equates to how our brain functions, and ultimately we're always looking for safety. For me, safety is my family, my wife, my kids. Safety is our job security. Safety is having a home, where we live, where we go to. When thing, these things are threatened, it's a massive amount of stress into the system. It doesn't matter how many hormones you take, how many supplements you take, this is going to drive hormonal dysfunction. Do you guys get that? you guys see that? So sometimes you do have to ask your clients questions. For example, how stressed are you? Because ultimately, if they have all these different symptoms going on, it could be driven by the stressors that are going on uh, within their life. So be aware of that. We can be a stressor. I'm not a big fan of annihilating a client so that they can visit Mr. Pukey or vomit or be ruined for days after a training session. If a client finishes an exercise session and they come to you two days later and go, oh my God, I had to take a nap that day and the next day I could barely get out of bed. That means that was way too much stress into the system, whether there was too much volume or too much intensity. When it comes to exercise and someone has signs of the hormone dysfunction, less is always more. So always think about that. And when it comes to exercise sessions, from my experience, it's always better to in keep the intensity high. So intensity in regards to strength training is the, the load, correct? So the percent of your one, uh, one RM. But you want to keep the weights heavier, but keep the volume low. Because usually what happens, it's that fourth, fifth, sixth set that really drills a client into the ground. It's not so much the first and second set, but it's the volume that really kills a client. So be aware of that. So if someone comes to you, they're fatigued, they're tired that day, still you can push them up the weights a little bit and they'll feel okay, just don't do too much of it. Uh, also with uh, the other stressors, uh, what's unfortunate is that a lot of uh, women are primarily, uh, prematurely put on birth control medi medication. And again, these are just synthetically derived hormones and there are lots of other uh, simple strategies that you can take that you can re recommend to clients besides getting on the pill because once they're on it, it's very difficult to try to get them off of it or to try to adjust them off of it. Uh, I mean, I've had even one tennis player, elite tennis player in our local area, and she had chronic bladder infections, uh, chronic in interstitial cystitis, and they didn't know what to do. So they said, well, I don't know. We don't know what else to do, so they put on birth control. Um, and that's what's constantly happening with a lot of our clients. They don't know what to do, so they just say, well, let's, let's try that, see if that works. And that's literally what's happening. Coffee. How many live to drink coffee? How many can function without coffee? Okay, that's pretty good. That's what's interesting about fitness professionals is that people that exercise... Uh, even when I test them with their hormones, even though their, their paperwork looks atrocious and really bad in terms of their hormones and their cortisol levels and their adrenal glands, their symptoms are not very good. But when people don't exercise, they're actually quite bad. With coffee consumption, for a lot of our clients, that's the only way that they can function throughout the day. And I challenge all of you, if you don't know what life is like without coffee, then go without coffee for a couple weeks and see what happens. If you have some important events going on, then don't do it then, because then you might not like me so much after that. But the, the withdrawal symptoms will vary, so be careful. Uh, I've even had a client in Colombia who <laughs> said, I'll be fine, don't worry about it. They come off coffee, 11 o'clock rolls around, no problem, 1 o'clock rolls around, blah, vomiting. That was her withdrawal symptom. Um, so just be wary that sometimes those can happen, not very often. Uh, but the typical withdrawal symptoms are going to be headaches, fatigue, lethargy. Uh, but we have to be careful because whenever someone drinks coffee for energy, they're forcing the adrenal glands, which I'm going to go over in a moment. They're about the size of your uh, walnuts that sit above your kidneys. And 
There are walnut-sized glands that are very small but very, very important for the hormonal system and for dealing with stress and for the sex hormones. And when people drink coffee and they don't get energy after one cup, they go to two cups, then after a while that doesn't work. So what do they do? They open to three cups. Eventually they're drinking a pot of coffee a day or they're switching to something like Monster or Red Bull or who knows what's out there now. Um, and that, what that constantly does is that forces the adrenal glands to pump out more nutrients and require more energy and it fatigues these little guys that are very important for other jobs in the body. This is absolutely the worst food that you can ever consume for breakfast. I know they want you to believe that cereal is the best food. It's whole grain. Um, yes, it was whole grain at one point, but no longer is it when it gets to your mouth. And if you want to know how fast cereal digests, just get a cereal. It could be Rice Krispies. It could be Corn Flakes. It could be Wheat Puffs, whatever you want. Take a scoop of it, put it in your mouth, Chew around 10 times and let it sit there for about a minute. I've done that at home. My wife thinks I'm nuts sometimes, but I do these experiments. And literally, it melts in your mouth within about a minute. So imagine, what is that going to do to your blood sugar? It's going to cause it to skyrocket, and then it's going to go up and down and cause this roller coaster effect all day long. If you want to look at a really interesting book, it may be hard to find. It was published in the 1940s or 50s. It was by a guy named Paul A. Stitt. Uh, S-T-I-T-T, and it was called Beating the Food Giants. He was a food scientist for Quaker Oats, uh, the Quaker Oats Company. And so what he did was he, they did three studies. Uh, one, they fed the one group of rats uh, as much puff wheat cereal as, as they wanted. The second group, they just fed it water, and the third group, they fed it the box. And the first group to die were the ones that ate the puff wheat cereal. The second one to die were the ones that just had water, and the third ones to die were the ones that ate the box. So the moral is eat the box and live longer. <laughs> There's more nutritional value. The reason why is that all cereals, it doesn't matter if it's organic, it doesn't matter if it's this, that, it goes through what we call an extrusion process. It's very high heat, high pressure. So that's why when I did that experiment chewing it in my mouth, you have amylase, which is an enzyme that digests carbohydrates in your saliva. So literally, you put it in your mouth, it's digesting as it's in your mouth, as you're chewing. So that's why it causes such a hormonal uh, dysfunction in regards to your blood sugar and then eventually to hormones later on the road. Uh, dairy is another one. We have to be wary about, especially if it's at least not organic dairy or grass-fed dairy, is that there's tons of uh, recombinant bovine growth hormone. Who knows what else they put in the milk? Um, we haven't talked so much about insulin, but insulin is one of those hormones in the body. And so for those of you that are working with clients that want to lose body fat, which is pretty much all of you, most people don't know this, that with dairy, dairy, doesn't matter what it is, yogurt, it could be low-fat milk, 2%, 1%, whole-fat milk, all the spectrum, it's highly has an insulinogenic effect. So all of you have heard of the GI index, glycemic index. Does that sound familiar? If you don't know, glycemic index, all that means is that when you eat a food, it causes your blood sugar to go up. And they test certain foods. A banana is different than rice, and rice is a bit different than a potato, and so forth. So the higher it goes up, the worse it is for you. Well, in the same way, they tested all dairy products in regards to insulin. And if you know anything about insulin, insulin is a very important hormone, but you have too much of it, that stores a lot of the carbohydrates that we eat into one of three places, muscle, liver, and fat cells. So that's why with dairy, if you want people to lose body fat and weight over the long term, you got to get them off the dairy because it will constantly high cause da uh, insulin levels uh, all day long. So if you're, someone's not progressing and they're constantly having cottage cheese and yogurt all day long, Start taking that stuff out, and then you'll start noticing normalization of their insulin levels. Uh, as I told you, estrogen levels are a big problem. One of the reasons is plastics. So our water is stored in plastics, plastics from the water supply, all those different things. It sounds a bit overwhelming, but I'm going to give you some practical strategies. So we're coming to the good stuff. So don't worry. Uh, of what you can eat, uh, what you can supplement as well to help your body detoxify uh, some of these estrogens that can cause a lot of these hormonal disruptions. 
They are the xenoestrogens. So you probably have heard of the BPAs, the bisphenol A's. That's a real big problem in plastics. They're starting to change that, but knowing the industry, they're probably going to find something else that's even more toxic. So just be ready. Uh, tofu, soybeans, soy foods. Those are eaten in uh, the name of health. But in my opinion, this causes lots of disruptions within people's physiology. The reason why the food industry is pushing soy products is because Asians eat lots of soy. Well, I'm Asian. I'm Korean. I'm 100% Korean. If you look at most Asian cultures, for example, Korean cultures, they eat mostly beef. Japanese typically eat mostly fish and seafood, and Chinese eat a lot of pork and different other types of proteins. But most Asians did not choose soy because it was a more superior source of protein. And if you go to any Korean restaurant, how many have gone to a Korean restaurant? Have you guys been to a barbecue place? How many different dishes do, you, do they bring to you besides the main course? About like 10 different small dishes. Soy is just a condiment. It's not made for consumption of soy milk with soy cereal, then a soy sandwich with soy cheese, and then at night you have your soy pasta and then your soy fake whatever sausage, meat, patty, God knows what. By the time it gets to your plate, it is so processed. If you look, just go to any health food store and look at the soy milk. You'll see it in the refrigerator section, and then you see it in the middle of the aisle, Go well, what the heck? How come it's refrig some are refrigerated, some are not? Because it's a non-food. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. It doesn't go bad. So be wary of that because it can disrupt hormone levels, especially in males and driving up estrogen levels. It only takes about 50 grams of it to drive up estrogen levels. A really good book is by Kayla Daniel. K-A-A-Y-L-A. And then last name is Daniel, spelled Daniel. And she wrote the book called The Whole Soy Story. It's about 550 pages with, I, I think, 350, 500 references about why soy is not good for you. By the time you read through half of it, you're like, okay, enough. I get the picture. I get the idea. But one interesting thing that I always remember, actually two things. One is with this, uh, the oil soy industry, what they did was when they were uh, expressing soy oil and getting the oil out of the soybeans, they had a, all this sludge left over from the soybean. So what they ended up doing is they used that sludge to uh, bind up cardboard, you know, where we send boxes. Well, that sludge we call soy protein isolate now as a health food. That's one thing. Uh, guys, if you want to go be a monk at a... Monastery, eat lots of soy, because that's what they feed monks, so that they stay celibate. So if you don't want any sex drive at all, and you want to grow boobs, eat lots of soy. It's a very good product for you. So it's not something that we should be consuming as a health food. If anything, it causes lots of other dysfunctions. I don't have time to go into the other things, uh, but the book is a good resource for that if you want to do some thorough reading. Wine. For all you wine lovers... This is probably the most dysfunctional fluid that you could drink ever. Sorry to ruin the party. And I know at 6.45, everybody's going to have their, their alcohol. My point in saying this is that if you enjoy a glass of wine here and there, that's completely fine as your splurge or your whatever. But to drink alcohol in the name of health, it's really not healthy at all. If you look at the research on alcohol consumption, one glass of ethanol has been shown to decrease your nocturnal release or growth hormone. So those of you who don't know, know, when you sleep at night, your body produces its most amount of growth hormone at night. Well, we know growth hormone. It helps you stay lean. It helps you regenerate tissue. It helps you recover. That's why athletes are taking it, because it helps them stay lean, and it helps them recover from injuries. We all produce it at night so that you can recover. But with one glass of ethanol, alcohol, you reduce it by 63%. I'd say that's quite a bit. With two glasses, you decrease it by 81%. Now, some of you say, well, I'll just go get growth hormone therapy from the doctor and inject it. Well, if you're a millionaire, that's fine. It's probably five or six grand a month to maintain growth hormone injections like that. You have a nocturnal release of it every single night if you're sleeping appropriately. 
but when you drink alcohol, it disrupts it. The other part of that is research shows that it decreases your thyroid function. How many of our clients have a decreased thyroid output? A lot of our clients. The thyroid is the master gland for controlling your metabolism. So it's affecting your client's ability to lose body fat and lose weight. The other part of this is that it gets even better. I know your faces are going like, oh, oh my God. But see, the thing is that I wouldn't tell you guys to tell all this information to your client. I wouldn't tell your, you, know, you to go, Bleh, like all this information on client to vomit it. You guys are here to learn, so that's why I'm kind of vomiting on you guys. Um, I teach two or three days just at a time, so this is kind of a mini, like a little burp on you guys. But the, what I want to get at is the other parts of the hormonal dysfunction with wine is that for those of you that have wine, how well do you sleep? Really good? No. Most people, what do they do? They wake up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and go, why am I up right now? I don't know. Well, what happens is that, remember I told you that wine, it's the most dysfunctional fluid we can drink. And the reason why is it causes your blood sugar to skyrocket and crash. So when it crashes, that's an emergency state to the body. And what ends up happening is your body starts producing cortisol. It's a hormone produced by the adrenals I talked about earlier. But cortisol should be low at night when you sleep. That way melatonin can be high. So what ends up happening is cortisol is poured out at night, and cortisol is a stimulating hormone. So that's why people are like, I'm up. Either that or people go, no, I sleep great. I have three glasses of wine. I'm out. Well, yes, they're out, but it's what we call paradoxical sleep. So they are sleeping, but the sleep is not good quality. That's why they wake up tired in the morning. So now you're affecting a third of your life because you should be sleeping effectively and efficiently eight hours a day. So enough on wine. I don't want to depress you guys too much. Uh, endurance training. Uh, I have no problems with endurance training, but what I do have a problem with the, the overuse of endurance training. Uh, there's plenty of research now to show that SIT, short interval training, is just as effective for cardiovascular health. And I would say even more effective for what we're all after and all our clients are after is fat burning. So we want that afterburn effect. We want that EPOC, the post-exercise consumption. Well, we get that more efficiently with short interval training than endurance training. Uh, the reason being is that with endurance training, in order to go a distance of 60 minutes or whatever distance is for 60 minutes of duration, can the intensity be high? No. That's why it's endurance training. But if you bust your ass for 30 seconds, how long can you really go if you really bust your ass? Maybe 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds. So the point being is that there's a huge hormonal response. And that humor, humor, uh, hormonal response is that with endurance training, the intensity is low, but you constantly get a release of cortisol. It keeps going up. It's that stress hormone. But with weight training, short interval training, burst training, whatever you want to do, whatever your modality is, kettlebells, weight training, doing snatches with the bar, whatever it is, you get a concomitant rise of testosterone as well as cortisol. So you end up finishing with a higher testosterone ratio versus cortisol ratio. And this happens equally in female and males. So it's one of those choices of exercise. If you only have time for anything, you always choose weight training or short interval training, not the treadmill, not being a rat on a, on a spin wheel. That's not going to do much. Yeah. Correct. The question was, she'd read research about uh, tapping into type 2B fibers and having a growth hormone output. Yes. Uh, it depends on the type of variables. So this goes more into maximal strength training and power training. Um, but depending on what the variables are, whether the reps are, are low or whether the tempo is fast or whether the um, if you, multiple sets are performed, it depends what kind of hormone response you want. I mean, that in itself is a 90-minute lecture at least about the hormone response. But if you guys start just researching it, you'll find that you can get a good growth hormone response, a testosterone response uh, with weight training. Uh, it's just proven. It's all out there uh, with females and males. It's, it's equivalent. Just, it's just the, the, um, the amount may be less with a female, but percentage-wise, they get just as much of a release. Now, if you come across this tiger in nature, 
what's going to happen? It's going to be fight or flight, right? So one of three things will happen. You're either going to pick up a stick and fight like hell and kill the tiger. Two, you're going to run like mad, get up a tree, and then the tiger's going to go away. Or three, you're going to eat and the stress is result. <laughs> right? The point in telling you guys this is that stress is there. Stress is not bad, but it, when stress is chronic, that's when it becomes an issue. So can I get a volunteer just to stand on stage? Anybody? I'm not going to hurt you or anything. All right. What was your name? Tashi. Tashi? Yes. Okay. All right. So face your accusers here. So let's say I'm stressed. So I'm stressed right here. So let's say she is a mom of four children. So she gets woken up at 3 o'clock, then she gets woken up at 4.30, then 5.30, then 6 o'clock, the alarm goes off. And then Tommy comes in, pooped in his pants, poops everywhere, smearing on the walls, okay? She hasn't got breakfast, stress goes up, right? And then she's got to take three of her kids to school. And then they're not fighting, they're playing handball, they bust the ball, they kick the ball over the fence, she's got to go with the ball, she hasn't even got to school yet. And then she's got a PTA meeting, and she's got you-know-who, Mrs. Smith, who's just a you-know-what, and she's telling how her kids are doing this, and you know the school's doing that. How fun are we? A lot of fun right now? No, okay, yeah. thanks. But you get my drift. All of our clients, whether it's us, um, whether it's CEO, attorney, our moms, our dads, they're constantly bombarded with stress. With remember this picture, it's boom. Stress is there. You either get away, you fight, you get eaten. It's resolved. But with someone like this, they're constantly bombarded by stress all day long. So they never get a break from it. So you see how the cortisol levels and the, all these different hormones can get disrupted just because they're constantly stressed out all day long. And cell phones don't make it any easier. Now we have email, we have text, we have Twitter, we got Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. I mean, you, you name it, it just gets piled on higher and deeper. Uh, so we get this adrenaline release. And don't get me wrong, when people are in the state of this high cortisol output or high adrenaline release, it's kind of a cool feeling. It's that you're, you're just ready to go, you're amped all the time, and you got your natural high going, but that only lasts for so long. It does last for a long time for some people because they self-medicate with um, caffeine, Red Bull, and all these other different things for a long period of time. But I've seen people, you know, do function this way for 20 years, sell a company, and then all they want to do is play golf every day, and they're, they can't get out of bed. Every single joint in their body hurts, they're fatigued, they're depressed, all those sorts of things happen because they've deplete, completely depleted their body. So this is a, just a picture of the adrenal glands, of how complex they can be. And uh, what you want to know, there's going to be a test after this for you guys to leave, after you guys leave, so just make sure you pay attention. Just kidding. It's a complicated slide on how your hormones work. But what I, all I want you guys to remember out of this slide is this. Remember I talked about I was, I was poking her being the stress the whole time and doing this? Well, a lot of people are up around here. So if you see up here, they've got cholesterol up and through here, and then they produce pregnenolone and DHEA, testosterone, estradiol. Those are the sex hormones. Do you guys understand that part? So what happens is the arrows come down and your body produces over here the sex hormones, testosterone, your estrogen, your DHEA. Now what tends to happen is that when people are so stressed out and they have stress going all the time, you see those red arrows going this way? So the red arrows are coming this way, going to progesterone and producing cortisol. So whatever the immediate stress is, the body will always try to produce cortisol all the time. So remember I talked about how safety is so important for people in regards to their homes, their jobs, their family? Well, that is a priority over having a baby. You guys understand that? So the body will shunt all its resources, all the energy, cholesterol, circulating illness, all that stuff to produce cortisol because the person's stressed out. 
to the max. So that's why what happens is the estrogen and the testosterone takes a back seat because a person's so stressed out. You guys see that? So that's why ultimately we've got to look at someone's stress in their body because that is the driving cause of why they're not producing enough estrogen, progesterone, or testosterone for a male. And that's ultimately what we have to go after and fix because otherwise they'll constantly have other sorts of dysfunction uh, down the road if you just give them injections of testosterone or some kind of uh, medication for uh, synthetically derived progesterone or uh, estrogen. And just to give you an example with menopause, uh, with females with menopause, it's essentially a baton race. So when a woman starts net menstruating and they stop producing ovaries, what should happen is the ovaries go, okay, adrenals, I want you to, I'm going to pass the baton to you and adrenal glands, you should start producing more estrogen. So typically the adrenal glands produce about 33% of the estrogen in the body. As a woman goes through menopause, that climbs up to about 50%. But I just showed you this woman who's been living a lifestyle for 20 years, who's stressed out, doesn't eat right, doesn't control her blood sugar, has poor lifestyle choices. Are her adrenals, do they have the capacity to produce more estrogen? No. It's tired. It's like a, dead, it's like a horse in the desert. Let's say I'm beating the heck out of the horse, and the horse goes, I ain't going anywhere until you give me rest, food, and water. I can't do anymore. And that's what a lot of people end up doing because their adrenals are so tired and fatigued. So ultimately, you've got to help people by helping them to de-stress. And you guys can do it if you use light yoga, tai chi, you can do meditation. All those types of things uh, work wonders with people that are highly stressed. Our clients will try to make the best choices when they're having a lot of these different symptoms. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of them are just confused. They look on the internet, they do this, they do that, they go to a doctor. Um, you know, they may go to some type of specialist and they put them on hormones and then they ultimately they're turned the wrong way and they continue to actually get worse if anything. They gain more weight. They have more hot flashes because they're put on these hormones. Hippocrates said long time ago, let food buy that medicine and medicine be thy food. Very, very powerful. Uh, always remember this because food is a drug. I love this quote by Dr. Barry Sears. He's the author of The Zone Diet. I don't believe in just The Zone Diet. I just like his quote. And every time that you or your client put something in their mouth, you are either creating a favorable or unfavorable hormonal response. For some of these out there right now, I can tell that you did not eat the right food because you are doing that. If you have food coma after lunch, that means you did not eat the appropriate food. Classic sign right there. So that means you got to go back and say, well, what did I eat? Was it that pasta? Was it the bread? Was it the sugar? Was it the coffee? Don't know. Classically, what if you give this to a five-year-old? What do we know is going to happen within about 30 minutes? Boing, 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 bouncing off the walls. Are we any different than a five-year-old? I'm not. My wife still says I'm a third-year, three-year-old, but that's okay. Um, still gonna have fun. But my point in saying is that sugar drastically affects our physiology. So why doesn't other food affect our physiology? It does. So if you're picking the right foods, you can drastically affect hormones. So whatever you're choosing to eat is going to be that favorable or unfavorable response. So really, what do we do? Where do we go at? Where do we start? That's really what we're after. So we're getting to the good stuff. So don't worry. We'll bring this to a good point. Each morning that all of you wake up, so when you woke up this morning at 6 a.m., you have a clean slate. Always think of it as a clean slate. You've slept for eight hours. It's a clean slate in regards to your hormonal system. So it's up to you in regards to what you're going to paint on that canvas. So it's very important to break that fast. And the best way to do that is with water consumption. 
Water is very, very important for normalizing your hormones. Research shows that when someone is dehydrated, their cortisol levels get dysregulated, and when you hydrate them, they normalize. What do most people drink first thing in the morning? Coffee, which I already showed you, causes stress on the adrenals, and it only dehydrates someone even further. So at least if someone's going to drink coffee, you have them drink their water first. Yeah. Yeah, I would. He said he his question was, what's better? Is it to eat food first or water? I would say water first. Uh, water will impact the hormonal system uh, very quickly. It'll also help with bowel movements. But what I also find with a lot of clients is that once you get their water intake up, research shows that the proper amount of water will affect their cognitive abilities. So remember, we talked about people with anxiety, with depression. Uh, any other sort of mental thoughts, we can affect that by giving them the right amount of water. That's just proven. Brains made eighty percent water. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. He said, "Is there any benefit to having warm, like a lemon drink?" I'm okay with that if you want to add lemon to give it flavor, so that a client is more compliant with water. And the most important thing is just to get the water tank in there. That's the first thing. So the amount of water should be one liter per 30 kilos of body weight. That should be standard day in, day out. There is no reservoir of water intake. This should always be uh, in there all the time. So one liter per 30 kilos of body weight. No, no, this is for the whole day. Yeah, and clarify. Yeah, typically if, if you want to, if you're a numbers person, I usually recommend about 25% of their intake should be first thing in the morning. And they can sip it, they can guzzle it, whatever they want to do. But they should be consuming that immediately when they get up in the morning. That gets things going. And what ends up happening is people that wake up and they're kind of like just disoriented, they kind of have cobwebs in their head, have that kind of cognitive fog, that starts to clear up quite rapidly. So when people start the day on a good note, isn't that a good thing? Yeah, it's a very important. Rather than waking up on a bad note and then they feel like, oh, my day's just crappy and rubbish and this is going to be a bad day today. So it makes a big difference. Uh, what you should do is, as just a simple tool, is just get them to get a cool container. Canteen, something that's pink or their favorite color, whatever it takes to get them to get their drink, drink their water or for you to have their, your special glass or your bottle. Get something that is yours so that you know, okay, I just need to drink three of these a day. And that way it's easy, it becomes a habit, and it's always a, a habit that's always there. Uh, you don't ever forget. Now, with water intake, oftentimes the complaint is, oh, Rob, water's so boring. It's how many flavor. You always hear that. Well, the reason why most people are looking for something with flavor, sugar, sweetness, or something with bubbles in it, is because they're dehydrated to begin with. So if you have a client that's very stubborn, or you are very stubborn, and the only thing you drink is flavored water or diet soda, just start drinking the right amount of water first. Start with that. What ends up happening is once they get their water intake to the appropriate level, the need for drinks like this, soda, pop drinks, anything else, that starts to go downhill. They won't want it as much because they're hydrated. So they won't want something that's sweet. They won't want something with bubbles in it. They won't need it. Uh, this is a picture of Himalayan salt. So with water consumption, for every liter of water that you consume, you should add some kind of unrefined salt to it. So it should be either Celtic sea salt or Hawaiian pink salt or Himalayan salt. The salt, what that does is it has over 80 trace minerals or so. Sometimes they say 88. So it's completely different than regular sodium chloride. You need salt in your water because if you drink too much water without minerals, you just pee it right out. And it'll cause worsening of bloating, um, you know, fat fingers, fat toes. It sounds counterintuitive, but I use this hundreds of times with female clients, especially during their menstrual cycle, or they just feel like their water balance is off. Add salt to the water, and that start, it'll start to go away. 
and salt has been shown to help normalize the adrenal glands. What is salt? Is that again? Uh, Celtic sea salt. Celtic. It, yeah, Celtic sea salt or any of the pink salts. The salt should look gray. It shouldn't look white. If it looks white, then it is processed. Because oftentimes they'll say sea salt, but it's still white. It's still processed. So get something with color in it. Uh, very good question. It's just a tiny pinch. If it tastes like seawater, way too much. It shouldn't even ta- change the taste of the water. It should just be a small, tiny pinch, and that's it. Absolutely. It'll help a tremendous amount. Yeah. 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 Just talk to my wife. She uh, was pregnant twice by me, of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> With two beautiful boys, but we we use salt quite a bit. I mean, even I've had a client in. Uh, Can I say something? Sure. So my feet were like sausage. You know, you get pregnant, your everything's like swollen. <laughs> I I added the salt, and literally within minutes, it flushed out. And my I had skinny feet again. You know, but it, now, it like now that's not a typical response, but she had a really good response. But I've had the similar types of responses with other female clients with bloating in the arms and all sorts of other things. Uh, especially when hot, humid weather, when people are profusely sweating. You ever taste your sweat? What does it taste like? Salt. So for some reason, in the last 30, 40 years, they said, oh, don't use salt tablets or whichever. If you're an endurance athlete and you're sweating like a mother and you're running a marathon, you absolutely have to use salt. At that point, it just doesn't matter what salt it is. You just take salt tablets because you're profusely sweating salt. The reason why people get in trouble when we usually get one person dying in a marathon, you know, in New York or the Boston Marathon, some of the big ones, is people think, oh, I'm going to be sweating a lot. I need to drink lots of water. What does that do? You go into a condition called hyponatremia, which totally dysregulates your sodium potassium balance. So don't think salt is bad. It's not bad at all. Some of you may be thinking, well, what if someone has hypertension, blood pressure? There's only maybe 5 to 10% of the population you are sensitive to salt. And even then, it's usually sodium chloride when you're just using that with just white uh, table salt. Yeah, use the, the colored salt. As I said before, blood sugar control is very, very important for hormonal control. You must break the fast. So like we break the fast with water, you need to break that fast with food first thing in the morning. Blood sugar control is key to this. So anytime that people skip breakfast or they eat the inappropriate uh, foods and you get that roller coaster effect of blood sugar and they go hyperglycemic and they go low and up and down, that roller coaster effect, you are essentially stressing the body out. And so when you get somebody to control their blood sugar, stabilize it, that ultimately will help stabilize their cortisol levels over a day's period. So it's very important to break that fast as soon as possible. Usually get up, Drink your water, and you can probably eat within about 10 or 15 minutes uh, because it's, it gets through your system fairly quickly. Oops. And with someone with hormonal dysfunction, you must eat a high-protein diet. Uh, most people are these days are afraid to eat protein, but you have no amino acid pool. The only amino acid pool you have are, is your muscle mass. So if you want to lose a mo- lot of muscle mass, uh, then don't eat protein. But a lot of us know that in order for us to be healthy, we need to maintain our muscle mass, whether it's weight loss, fat loss, uh, or sports performance, whatever it is. So ideally, a higher protein diet is going to be more beneficial for a lot of our clients because they're having high amounts of stress. The other benefit to a high protein diet is that people don't realize is that for brain function, the way your brain functions is we have these chemicals called neurotransmitters. And if you look at any sort of neurotransmitter brain formula on the market in terms of supplements, always the main ingredient are amino acids. And where do we get amino acids from? We get it from chicken. We get it from meat. We get it from proteins that we eat. So it's very important, especially for our clients that are supposedly having these hormonal dysfunctions and they're having brain fog and they can't think and they're having anxiety, you've got to give them more protein. It helps smooth them out. Cholesterol. Everybody's afraid to eat cholesterol. I will go into this to extensive detail in my lecture, Fat is Your Friend. So you got to come to my lecture on Sunday. Uh, But what I'm going to talk about is how your body needs cholesterol. Because in order to make your hormones, you need cholesterol. 
I'm not making this up. If you look at any sort of chemistry textbook in regards to how your hormones are made, cholesterol is the wall ingredient to make your hormones. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. That's just the way the body functions. Nothing's made up. It's just physiology. And if you look at this slide, cholesterol is that raw ingredient to make your testosterone, your progesterone, your estrogen, your cortisol. So when people are put on those statin medications, one of the problems we have is we have major hormonal dysfunction. And if cholesterol levels fall too far, there's depression, and ultimately there's a big side effect, which is death, if you drop cholesterol too low. So cholesterol is important for you to make your hormones. I know this looks so bad, but it tastes so good, and it's really good for you. Because ultimately, one of the, the type of athlete that I work with is a, are a lot of LPGA, a lot of PGA uh, players. And uh, one of the things about if you play golf is that you, it takes four to five hours. So you can't sit down at the turn at the ninth hole and have your lunch and eat there. You're, you're, you're playing. So what we have to do as my job as the sports nutritionist is I have to stabilize her blood sugar. And one of the best ways to do that is with bacon and eggs because there's lots of fat in it and there's lots of decent amount of protein in it. It sounds like it's heart clogging, but I will dispel all those myths on Sunday of what eggs consist of and what bacon consists of because most people think it's all saturated fat and it's not. But one of the things you've got to do is stabilize the blood sugar with protein intake and fat intake and the blood sugar will be nice and stable. You'll flatline it. Um, beef is another one. Steak, a uh, very, very good protein source in order to help stabilize the blood sugar. But you do want to always try to get grass-fed uh, beef versus grain-fed beef because there's a higher amount of omega-3s. And we know omega-3s have also a hand in stabilizing hormones. So just eating beef in itself uh, is good, but grass-fed beef is going to be your ultimate choice because you're going to get uh, omega-3s in it as well. Uh, chicken, obviously, is, is a good source as well. Um, I would prefer people to eat the skin on the chicken. It's probably the best part of the chicken. Obviously, you get a free-range organic chicken. But remember, that fat is going to go towards the manufacturing of someone's hormones, as I showed you previously. Uh, shrimp is another good one. So shrimp, we know, has good protein source, but it also has cholesterol that will help, again, support that hormonal production. I usually recommend, when I say high protein for most of our clients in general, the palm size, about the size of their palm, about the thickness, they should be eating that for breakfast, lunch, dinner. That's what your, your, your goal is. If someone is a high-level strength athlete or they're doing lots of endurance training uh, or they're you know, a skill athlete, they play rugby or they're playing football, then yes, you would probably have to increase their protein intake just because of the demands of just breaking down uh, connective tissue and muscle mass and so forth. Butter is very good. Obviously, butter has some cholesterol, but also has saturated fat, which helps with hormonal production. Also, for a lot of clients with some type of hormonal dysfunction, usually energy is always an issue. Lack of energy, low energy. And butter is a four-carbon chain butyric acid. So basically what that means is your body can readily break it down and utilize it as an energy source. So it's a very useful fat, and it tastes really good. And most people can stay satiated. So when we're working with a client that needs to lose body fat, what's one of the main problems with people that are on a diet? They get hungry all the time. When they actually eat real food and they eat fat, they actually are satiated, and they don't seek out things like sugar and chocolate and processed foods. Coconut oil is a really good fat as well. Uh, There's some interesting thing about uh, coconut oil. Uh, it's very antimicrobial, meaning it's anti-bug, so it helps protect your digestive system. Um, but one of the reasons why I really recommend it with people that are hormonally challenged is with the energy. Uh, coconut oil is what we classify as a saturated fat, but it's a special saturated fat. It's a medium-chain triglyceride. For those of you guys that were you know, into bodybuilding, I was in that one of my younger years, we used to use MCT oils as an immediate source of energy on a low-carb diet. Well, the reason why we use that is because the MCTs in coconut oil 
it bypasses the stomach, goes to the portal vein, and goes right into the liver. So you get an immediate source of pick-me-up energy, but because it's a fat, the blood sugar is stable. So there's no up or down or drop off or anything at all. So any type of coconut, fat, oil, coconut product, shredded coconut, any of those products are really good for your clients with low energy levels. Really, really helpful. And I usually recommend about one tablespoon per meal. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's usually what I recommend in addition to some of the fats that they're getting from their meats and so forth. Obviously, there are some differences between chicken breast and chicken thighs and all those different things. Um, I will definitely answer your question. Um, I just still have a bunch of slides I want to definitely get through. So I, I want to finish the presentation, and I will definitely stick around as long as you guys want, just not until like 8 o'clock or anything, um, to answer any question you guys have. Uh, cruciferous vegetables. These are very, very key. There is a chemical compound called diendomethane, DIM for short. You'll see it sold in health food stores. But what this does in broccoli and cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, uh, all those different cruciferous vegetables, what they do is it helps to detoxify estrogen. So if there's any one choice that you have in regards to vegetables, always choose things like broccoli, the cauliflowers, these cruciferous vegetables. They really help to detoxify the body in the long run. Uh, this is a picture of sauerkraut. There's an interesting study on the sauerkraut itself that it has higher amounts of dienomethane. Besides that, it's a great way to get probiotics into the system. Uh, and you can get kimchi, you can get you know, daikon radish. Anything that's fermented is really good for the digestive system. But what they've showed in particular with sauerkraut is that it has a high amount of dienomethane. So it's one of those good estrogen detoxifiers. Of course, um, Fruits are, uh, are good as well, uh, but we do have to be careful with the amount of sugar in fruits. So oftentimes when I tell a client, okay, I want you to just eat more vegetables, I don't say vegetables and fruit because the biggest difference is the sugar that's in fruit. So be aware of that, especially with the clients that they need to lose some body fat, they are, they're in a time crunch, whatever. Um, definitely vegetables are always in, but you have to be aware of some of the fruits. Um, I would always recommend in regards to starches that when you do recommend starches, always recommend the least processed starches. So starches such as rice, uh, buckwheat, millet, uh, all you do is you simply soak it and then you, you cook it. Whereas if you get something like pasta, it's been ground down, it's been heated and cooked, then it's ground down. I mean, this goes through so many different processes, so by the time it gets to your mouth, just like with the cereal I talked about, it's so processed, you get that blood sugar rush, and you get that hormonal response that's unfavorable for our hormones. So always try to choose, you know, uh, tubers, parsnips, sweet potatoes, yam. All you do is you pluck it out of the ground, you wash it, and you heat it, you cook it. That's as um, unprocessed as you want to try to go with starches. That way it's healthier for you. There's more nutrients to it as well. Magnesium is a huge one I talked about. Uh, one thing if you want to perform is a magnesium load, I would perform it on yourself first. I forgot to put this in the lecture notes, but if you guys want to email me, um, I'm more than happy to email you my magnesium load chart. The interesting thing about magnesium, it's a mineral that's involved in over 350 processes in the body. Just from the standpoint of energy production, it's that spark plug your body needs to make ATP. But with magnesium, anytime you're stressed out, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, chemically, whatever it is, magnesium levels drop. Your boss pisses you off, magnesium levels drop. Your client, headache one, comes in, complains about everything, magnesium levels drop. You're doing CrossFit classes, magnesium levels drop. So the thing is that I would say 80 to 90 percent of people are deficient in magnesium. Yeah. Does it help to sort of regulate your sleep pattern? Correct. So remember I talked about the fight or flight? You're either going to fight or you're going to die or get eaten. Well, that's more of what we call a sympathetic response of your nervous system. That's the fight or flight in you. The opposite of that is the parasympathetic nervous system. They aren't separate, it's just with whether one's on more than the other. You guys, make, that makes sense? It's not that one's on, one's off. 
Magnesium is a very parasympathetic nutrient, meaning it helps calm the system down. Most people are so hyped up from all the adrenaline release, from all the stress, they need to calm their system down. So what I have is a magnesium chart. What you basically do is magnesium is only found, 1% of it is found in the blood. So to do blood work is just a waste of time. All of it's found in your skeletal muscle, your internal organs, your bones, and everywhere else. So what you simply do is you just keep taking magnesium until you get the shits. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about uncontrollable diarrhea. I'm talking about when you go to the, the loo and you go to the, you know, sit on the toilet, you go, wow, it's like soft stool or, you know, watery stool. And then you just back off. So what you would do is you start with one and one with breakfast and dinner, and every three days you would up it by um, two. Just email me if you want it. You're more than welcome to try it. I use magnesium glycinate chelate. There's many different forms of magnesium, but this is the, I guess, I would say the highest absorbable form of magnesium um, that I've found to work quite well. And I've seen some amazing changes with magnesium. Um, if you want to read a good book, read the book, The Magnesium Miracle. But email me, I can give you my magnesium load chart if you want. Uh, borage oil. This is very good for hormonal dysfunction, especially for our women clients that are going through dysmenorrhea, having cramping, bloating, mood swings, everything. There's plenty of research showing uh, the borage oil helps. Uh, borage oil contains an omega-6 fatty acid. It's called gamma linoleic acid. It's one of those omega-6s that's different than the other ones, but it's been shown to have a very good effect on uh, uh, premenstrual syndrome. And I've used it clinically, and it works quite well with a lot of people. And you just take about 240, 250 milligram capsules twice a day for a female client. You need to give it time, uh, probably a few cycles, but they'll notice probably a difference within two to three cycles. If they don't, then there's something else going on. Then you need to refer out to someone like me or someone who's well-versed in dealing with some of these hormonal dysfunctions. Uh, this is just a picture showing about uh, DIM, methane I talked about before. You can get it in supplement form. For me, I take it all the time as a male because I don't know where estrogen are coming in from, from the water, from the food. So I just take it prophylactically all the time. Uh, and uh, you can take it in a supplement form. And usually it's one little tablet twice a day or so. And that's one prophylactic way you can help yourself detoxify from a lot of the estrogens, female or male. For um, our hormones, all of you are fitness professionals. If you love endurance training, that's fine, but you must put your clients through some kind of resistance training. We talked about it earlier, about how with activating fat twitch muscle fibers, so that's jumping, being explosive, doing ollie lifting, it's doing snatches, cleaning jerks, vertical jumps, just doing resistance exercise has shown to have a favorable hormonal effect on the body. That's why most people feel so good after they finish exercising with all of you. You're in the position to do that. So make sure that you incorporate some type of resistance training, whether it's body weight stuff or TRX, whatever modality you like to use, incorporate that because that'll make a big difference in regards to their hormonal system, but also muscle mass. We know that with muscle mass, one of the markers for anti-aging is how much muscle mass that someone can hold on as they get older. Because after the age of 20, everything goes downhill, right? Um, with hormones and muscle mass, that's true. But with weight training, some of the uh, nutritional recommendations that I made today, you can really help deter that from happening and maintain muscle mass as well as some of those hormones. Um, some things to be aware of is that with our females, you have to be aware of this area of estrogen. So you see how the estrogen, the yellow line, is peaking? We have to be aware of that because with peaking estrogen levels, we know that with the ligamentous systems of the AC joint, uh, or excuse me, not AC joint, the ACL with the sacro, uh, iliac ligaments, sacro tubus ligaments, they all contain estrogen receptors. So when a woman is peaking with estrogen and they're sore and they're achy and they feel like their joints are kind of flopping around, most women are hypermobile than men, you have to make sure that you adjust the loading parameters of your weight training program. At that period of time, it's better to go higher intensity and lower volume because ultimately their joints are loose. You want to tighten them up with muscles. 
It's very similar, your ligaments, to that six-pack of beer, the little plastic ring where you take the beer out. Once you stretch it out, you can't put it back in. The only thing holding it together is muscle mass, especially with people with ligamentous injuries. So in that particular time of the month, shorter ranges of motions, bench presses to the floor, um, squat range of motion may be lower, but you can increase the load so that the muscle mass and tension goes up, and they'll feel much more stable in SI joints, other parts of joints in their bodies. Uh, timing is everything. So make sure that with regards to exercise, if someone has an inability to go to sleep, they got monkey mind, they just can't get to bed, you've got to make sure that exercise is earlier in the day. If you exercise them at 7 or 8 o'clock at night and they have a problem sleeping, you're driving up cortisol levels. So you've got to make sure you push the exercise towards the earlier part of the day and they'll be able to sleep much more efficiently. And meditation. So like I said before, use Tai Chi, Qigong, use these different other courses. Get them to another instructor or whoever else where they can de-stress and do some of these meditative exercises or meditative breathing. It helps a tremendous amount in regards to de-stressing the person. And they take an active role in it versus going to someone and, and fixing them. It's a very powerful tool. Sleep. Last thing. Sleep is probably the most underrated therapeutic tool that we can use. Most people, as I told you, they don't sleep at night. Rarely, if ever, get a good quality night's of sleep. So if you need to refer out for a sleep study or whichever, you need to get this handled. You always need to ask your client, how did you sleep last night? You know, they come in, they walk in the door, how, how was your day, whichever, you know, did you sleep? Oh, no, someone was up all night and I didn't get any sleep. Well, in that session, you need to modify the intensity, modify the loads, maybe stretch them out a little bit more. Uh, make sure that they're sleeping enough because that's imperative to their hormonal health. Guys, my time is up with you. Uh, you can get in contact with me on uh, Facebook on my website, robertyang.net. I want to leave you with one more thought. And that's this. With hormone dysfunction, whether the doctor says they have it or they think they have it, remember, always ask the question, why? Why is it happening? Then at that point, you can try to figure out, okay, why is it happening? Then you come with a good strategy to figure out what you can do with them. I've given you some simple things. Hydration, stabilize their blood sugar, start de-stressing them. Simple strategy you guys can use on yourselves as well with your clients to start stabilizing their hormones. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much, Robert, for this afternoon's presentation. Can I just remind everyone to please fill in their evaluation form before you head out the door and just give it to the event crew up the back of the room. Thanks, guys. I've got to go to my next presentation, okay. so it's been great. Okay. You today. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure yet whether I'm with you tomorrow or not, but I'll check. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, Hotel.